Thank you very much for being here. Uh, please tell me your name and uh, your affiliation and what you do. Fantastic. Thank you for inviting me over. Uh, I'm Andre Schwirup. I'm from the University of Malta. I'm, in my day job, I'm a professor of quantum physics. I love that. I love teaching it uh, to my students. Um, but I also, I also conduct um, research in the field and I've, I've been moving towards uh, quantum communications more recently and also exploring some of the commercial aspects of that. Uh, but you are not Canadian, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, I'm Maltese by birth and well, upbringing. <laughs> so, born and bred in Malta. Um, and uh, uh, here we are at uh, the uh, Blockchain AI Summit. Um, but still, uh, you were invited to speak on stage about this strange thing, quantum, whatever, <laughs> right? Uh, quantum mechanics has been... Uh, um, uh, formulated uh, in the uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, and we are still not done with exploring it. Uh, however, uh, beyond the scientific um, theories, we are now uh, trying to develop technologies uh, that apply our understanding of quantum mechanics uh, to practical solutions. There are different kinds of uh, attempts. Could you tell me about these different kinds of uh, quantum things? Sure, of course. I'll, I'll start off with the first part of your of your of, of your sentence, which was uh, why, you know, in a sense, why am I here? Um, it's it's nice to see sort of all aspects of emerging technologies more broadly. Right? So blockchain technologies, AI, quantum, they will all impact how we do things very broadly. And it's 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 nice to look at the synergies between all of these and how we can talk to each other and affect each other because there's implications for AI and quantum in uh, so AI and blockchain in quantum and vice versa. So so that's 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 actually I really enjoy being here for, for exactly that reason. Um, now if I move on to uh, the second part of what you said so about the uh, the uh, sort of technological implications of quantum mechanics. This is something much more recent so as you said so we've been doing quantum mechanics for a hundred and something years now uh, but we've only been doing quantum technologies for depending on whom you ask 20 years or less. Uh, now, we issued a document as the European uh, sort of community of European quantum scientists. We issued a document in 2015, I think, or 16, called uh, the Quantum Manifesto, where we kind of set, set forth a vision for where quantum technologies will go in, in the coming decade or so. And there we broadly defined five uh, lines of uh, quantum technologies, which are extremely important, which will have huge impact in the future. So there's the big one, there's quantum computing. So everyone has heard about quantum computers and how they're going to change everything. And now we have uh, everyone who's, uh, who's anyone in tech who's in that race now. So there's Microsoft, Google, IBM, all these companies are now pushing the technology forward, which is fantastic because the leaps they've made in the past three or four years have been orders of making larger than what we had before. So that's, that's really nice seeing that come, come together. There's quantum simulation, which is a kind of special purpose quantum computer that's closer to market. And the idea there is to have not just a computer that can do whatever you want to do, but a computer that can give you new drugs, a computer that can create new materials. That's still a very, very, very hard problem to solve with the computers we have nowadays. But with uh, new kinds of uh, quantum computer, special purpose quantum computers called quantum simulators, we might be able to design, for example, superconductors that work at room temperature. And that would allow us to waste a lot less energy in transmitting it around the place. So that's that's uh, the second stream. Then there's quantum communications, which is uh, very, very important. And quantum communications are a kind of uh, a response a response to the threat posed by uh, quantum computers, because quantum computers can actually break or will be able to break our currently used security mechanisms. So public key cryptography, not all of it, but a lot of the algorithms that are used are vulnerable to quantum computers. The ones which are not currently vulnerable, we actually don't know whether they will be vulnerable in the future. So one has to also look at that with some, with some caution. So we, um, there's, there's quantum secure communication, which tries to guard against that and tries to create a, an environment where no one can attack our communications, even if they have a quantum computer. Then there's quantum sensing. And the example I always give, and this was given to me by someone working in the UK, is in London, they waste something like 100 million pounds a year digging in the wrong spot, uh, simply because uh, there's so much history under the streets of London that there's always a Roman this or a, uh, you know, a Victorian that. Uh, but it's very, very hard to see or sense what's beneath the surface. 
So we need better senses. And it turns out that there are some quantum systems which are perfect they're fantastic for creating better senses for gravitational fields, for magnetic fields. And these can look deeper which might, with much better accuracy. Basically save the taxpayer a lot of money. Plus, you know, prevent digging up holes in the wrong place, which is, which is not a good thing. And then there's uh, quantum software or algorithmics, which is uh, an interesting field of study in its own, on its own, because we actually don't know that much in terms of what we can solve with a quantum computer. We're still developing this field, and we have what potentially is the biggest revolution in, in computer science, but we still have only a small number of algorithms that we know work better on quantum computers. So what else is out there? What else can we break? What else can we do faster? And there's this emerging field of um, quantum computer science, if you want to call it that way, that looks into creating these algorithms. Now, all of these have very, very direct applications in, in, in many facets of society. Uh, so you are uh, one of the signatories of the Quantum Manifesto uh, that uh, uh, recommends probably the EU to invest uh, yes, and yes. give you more money. <laughs> exactly. But uh, 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 you also have uh, your own uh, specific uh, passion and, and yes. specialization. What is that and, and what are you doing in that field? Of course. Uh, so I, I've actually got sort of, uh, a leg in two different fields. Uh, so one of them is more on the theoretical front. And there we look at uh, what we call optomechanics. So it's tiny mirrors that vibrate and... Using light, we can control the motion of these things. We can create uh, new kinds of switches. We can also use it as a, as a probe to figure out how the universe works uh, in between the quantum world and the classical world around us. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. That's where a lot of my day job is, actually. Um, but I also have a very healthy interest in quantum communications. Um, this is it's sort of born out of, out of interest uh, and also out of the fact that Malta happens to have circumstances where, which allow us to perform groundbreaking experiments and really think about not just the academic side of it, but also the commercial and technological applications of it, just because of our size, just because of the mix of industries that are here. And uh, so uh, what are you doing in Malta with uh, quantum communication? So at the moment we're setting up, uh, so we've got a project funded very recently uh, by NATO actually. And what we're doing is we're sort of trying to push forward the distance barrier. So quantum communication suffers from a distance barrier um, when we're talking over quantum communications over fiber. So there's a distance barrier of around 100 or 200 kilometers, depending on how you count exactly. And we we have an activity going on to try and extend this by creating better synchronization on, on the two ends, by creating better detectors, by doing things a lot better. And we plan to do this over one of the many links, um, fiber links that link Malta to Sicily. Um, and this follows in the footsteps of our earlier experiment, which we published earlier this year, and we've got another follow-up paper coming soon, which uh, we uh, we regard as the sort of longest distance over which um, entanglement has been distributed. So this is quantum property underlying how quantum communications makes us secure. We call this entanglement. It's the longest distance of polarization entanglement has been distributed in the real world. So. N- one can count and one can argue with that, um, but in yeah, real world. So, so how far is uh, Sicily from uh, from Malta? So over a fiber, it's 96 kilometers. So that's how long the fiber was. Okay. And, uh, and so uh, you are able, through these experiments, to establish a, a communication uh, that is not only hard to uh, decipher, because maybe you are using quantum encryption over the communication as well, but actually the quantum entanglement uh, means that if somebody attempts to intercept the communication, uh, you will know. Exactly, exactly. So you will know if the link has been tampered with and you can mathematically show that no one can eavesdrop, no one can break into this communication link, no one can do anything with any data they might possibly get because it will just be a random jumble. Uh, so it's the most secure form of communication. Now, in our experiment, we actually stopped short from the final goal. What we did was we showed that there was entanglement being distributed uh, simply because we didn't have enough equipment to go the last bit. It is fascinating because since the Snowden revelations, uh, we know that uh, the military love uh, to uh, siphon uh, uh, all the data they can get and store it in data centers even for potential future decryption using quantum decryption, quantum attacks. Yes. 
uh, in including investing in tampering with uh, transcontinental uh, fiber uh, optic uh, communications uh, so that they can go uh, and just get everything. Um, but uh, you are telling me that the NATO is funding this uh, research and then they won't be able to um, intercept uh, what uh, they intercept today. Do you expect your findings to be prohibited in civil use? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I don't think so. so. So far, there are solutions on the market which approach this kind of functionality. Um, they're not used widely for a variety of reasons, um, but it's not for being blocked by governments. So, so far, no, this hasn't been blocked. So one has to see whether there's going to be a repeat of the encryption um, embargo that there was in the US where people couldn't uh, export encryption. Uh, so one has to see whether there's going to be something like that. But so far, nothing like that has emerged. Um, but of course, this is a, a double-edged sword because it's an issue of sovereignty, uh, sovereignty in the sense that if I have a link that can be broken into by foreign powers, then my national sovereignty is being impinged upon. So it's, it's also important for the people who can break into links. It's important for them to invest in these links themselves because they know that their counterparts elsewhere have the same capabilities that they do or very similar capabilities. So it's, it's, it kind of helps them and defeats them at the same time. So it's an interesting technology. Talking about counterparties, uh, the Chinese have been very proud about uh, having established uh, space-based quantum communication links. Yes. Um, is that something that has been uh, um, peer-reviewed? Uh, is the international community in agreement that they actually did what they said they did? Um, so I, the same people who, commu who collaborated with me on the Sicily link are also in one of the papers with the Chinese who, uh, when they sent some quantum, quantum encrypted information, it was a video conference between Austria and somewhere in China, I can't remember the exact locations. Um, my understanding is that the community, there is consensus in the community in, in terms of peer review that this it is what it says on the box. So that is exactly what they've done. Um, there are, of course, uh, things you can do to uh, to um, falsify certain experiments, but in my in my understanding, to my understanding, not that kind of experiment. So the same sort of thing with the experiment we did with Sicily. What we did technically was violate bills and equalities, and those you cannot fudge. So there's no way. And once you have that, you can. Get, that's a certification, that's a certificate, rather, that whatever is going on in between, even if there's an adversary who's got access to the stuff in between, the communication between the, the endpoints is still secure. So once you do that kind of, uh, that kind of test, then you, know, you really don't care what's in between. You really don't care who, who supplied you with the box because you've got a certificate that the endpoints are secure. Uh, so this can be done, this can be checked. One of the challenges that uh, more and more people have uh, in distinguishing uh, uh, what uh, is true or not in their world is that uh, reality is becoming imbued uh, with a sense of science fiction based magic that uh, they have a very hard time uh, deciphering. Um, a, a typical leap that uh, almost universally is made when talking about uh, entanglement and uh, uh, quantum communications uh, with two endpoints is to say, all right, so let's bring those two endpoints at a light year apart and uh, voila, we have uh, faster than light uh, information transmission. Um, do you have a one minute answer to why that is not the case? Yes. Uh, so let's say you've got an entanglement set up between two points, as you said, two endpoints, then I can do something on one end to uh, to transmit my information through the entanglement link to the other end. However, there's a big however, what the other person gets is still completely and utterly random. I actually have to call the person up and say, do this or do that. And once they've done this or that, the state they get at the end, the photon they have has, has changed and has changed to become exactly what I wanted to send. So before I call them up, they still have something which is random. They still have something which cannot be translated into any information. It's only once I call them up and I send, as the case, maybe one or two bits of information, 
that they can get the state at the end that I put in and they can get the information out. Now, um, Einstein very famously uh, believed that there would be hidden variables that uh, uh, would overcome the uh, things he didn't like about quantum mechanics. And uh, some of the uh, uh, results of the, based on Bell uh, inequalities and the non-locality of, uh, of uh, entanglement uh, were used to prove that there are no such hidden variables and that indeed, as weird as it looks like, this is the universe we are uh, living in. Unfortunately, uh, epistemologically and existentially, what this also means is that people go and say, oh, but Einstein was wrong about something he said, so as a consequence, uh, uh, Andre could be wrong about uh, the speed of light communication, and maybe in five years' time uh, we will be able to do um, hyperspace travel because I've seen it in the movies at Star Trek. <laughs> are there things that you are pretty sure um, science uh, is not going to falsify? It's a very big question, a very good one. Um, Causality. <laughs> so I, I, I am a firm believer in causality in the sense that if A causes B to happen, there is no way of turning this around and saying that B happened before A. Uh, so from that, that kind of using that as a base, you can kind of draw the line at what's possible and what isn't possible. So there are ways of using causality and its sort of um, mathematical formulation to limit what we call uh, generalized probability theories. So if one goes beyond quantum mechanics, which is a very specific probability theory, and one goes beyond quantum mechanics and says, okay, I'm gonna allow more general theories to exist, maybe ha not having hidden variables necessarily, but you know, maybe it's something which we can't even formulate easily. What kind of theories can exist if I allow, if I only believe in causality, for example, or if I believe causal in causality and something else, and one can delimit and one can say, okay, actually, these are theories which make sense because I can't have something happening before or after something else and still ca you know, causing something else to happen. Um, so I, if you had to ask me, that is the one golden rule. And of course, um, there are ways, there are many, many different ways to phrase it. And uh, as of nothing traveling faster than light is one way of phrasing or one consequence rather of it. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that anything that violates causality is likely to never happen. Um, good as a theorem um, um, states that very soon uh, our formal systems uh, become powerful enough to formulate undecidable statements. And my interpretation of that is a huge degree of uh, freedom with which we are endowed because at that point we are uh, empowered to pick one or the other of the outcomes as an axiom of an extended formal system. Okay. The simplest example is uh, uh, the um, axiom about parallel lines, uh, where if we say that actually they do meet, or they uh, diverge, we will get uh, non-Euclidean geometries, which are perfectly fine from a mathematical point of view, a little less intuitive than not what we um, uh, normally study. Um, and we can keep doing this because, of course, the extended uh, theory will also have uh, unprovable statements. And so choice after choice, free will after free will, uh, as it were, we are exploring the mathematical universe, branching in random walks, uh, and then uh, our experience uh, in the past 4,000 years has been that for some reason, uh, wherever we want to stop, that way station of our mathematical exploration will still correspond to some feature of the physical world. Okay. Um, which is a longer way of saying that, uh, that, that the world is mathematical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what is your uh, epistemological interpretation of that um, surprising feature of the world? It's 
something I never thought about properly, I have to be honest with you. Um, it is, in a way, in a very strong way, it is one of the things that attracts me to, uh, to, to, to studying the nature of the universe. Because it, I, I don't know, I, I can't explain it, I can't express it in words, but it's something which I find exceedingly beautiful, that we have this language which we picked up and discovered and kept expanding that somehow seems to describe all of this, all that we see, all that we don't see, and everything else self-consistently. And that is, I think, a, a crowning achievement of our species in, in, in that sense. Um, what, is, what, is, uh, what is perhaps interesting, though, is that we can also formulate ways of going beyond the physical ways of going beyond the the uh rules that we see so i i, I mentioned earlier generalized probability theories and these are also other theories that we can uh, we can um we can explore using you know they're in the same mathematical parameter space really they're just you know, one way you know slightly further this way slightly further that way in some bizarre or high dimensional space but they 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 teach us a lot about the universe, even if they can never be true, because they teach us about limitations we have in our own universe and things like that. So I, I don't know whether it's always going to be a fact that wherever we stop, whichever waypoint we stop at, we find a, a, a say, a more fine grain, a better description of the universe that we, we live in. Um, because we've, we have reached a certain point, I think, in our, in our, in our mathematical description where there seems to be a bit of a gap in between where we are now and where we want to be in understanding the universe more fully. Uh, we still can't understand where, why the universe is quantum on a small scale, not quantum on a large scale. Mm -hmm. We still can't reconcile, in other words, the quantum theory with relativity, fully at least. Um, so there's still some gaps to fill in, and it's kind of it has become a very discontinuous path. So we, we've kind of reached to a certain point, and we have a gap that we need to bridge before we continue going forward. So I'm not sure if I would characterize it as every waypoint we stop at, we find something which is better defined or described better. Um, going back to applications, um, there is a lot of talk about quantum supremacy, um, which is uh, the acceleration that a given economic or military power will receive when uh, a, a, a quantum computing, especially, but the other areas of uh, quantum technologies as well, uh, provide a, a, not, not, not only a sustainable competitive advantage, but an accelerating competitive advantage where others uh, supposedly will never be able to catch up. Do you subscribe to this view and are you afraid that people you like less than other people would uh, achieve that with uh, um, desirable outcomes that conflict with those that you would like the world to pursue. I think as in every big groundbreaking technology, there there is the possibility that it falls in the wrong hands, and and this is one of the reasons why. Uh, so we we begged the European Commission and you know it, it's it's it decided in our favor in a sense to invest in these technologies because we can't afford to fall behind in this race I mean one shouldn't call it an arms race per se but it, it is it is somewhat of a race there are issues of the, of the kind you mentioned in this and yes it is a possibility uh, as in with any as with any technology of this sort to yeah that some nation some actor that you don't like uh, or whatever, however you characterize it, will end up doing something much better and so much faster than you that you will never be able to catch up. Uh, I think if we ever get it, get to that stage, though, it's not going to be in the next couple of years. So so maybe in the next couple of years, we should really sit down and say, uh, sort of strategically plan how to how to steer this and you know what limits should be set to research, what limits should be set to any, what limits should be set to the, the commercial exploitation of these devices because that's where it comes to at the end of the day. Um, you know, unfettered commercial exploitation of everything can be a very scary thing at the end of the day as well. Uh, it allows anyone so much power with uh, fully fledged quantum computers that, yeah, even I'm scared of this. Um, but yes, in principle, in theory, it could be the case. Um, Malta has uh, promulgated a comprehensive uh, piece of legislation for uh, re um, regulating uh, digital ledger technologies, i.e. blockchain, and now uh, it is busy at work to do similarly for artificial intelligence. 
And the goal of both is to attract uh, talent, uh, investment resources, uh, and uh, uh, make sure that Malta can cope uh, with the pace of change uh, as a society and can uh, preserve its ability to uh, steer its own path uh, in a future that is uh, rapidly approaching. Um, is uh, it your understanding and expectation that the same is going to happen uh, with quantum technologies? And if yes, uh, what would your recommendation be to the corresponding task force uh, to achieve their goal? Sure. Um, I think there are some issues which can be regulated in this sense. But more than regulation, um, I would call it uh, sort of things like certification. So, for example, if I am a, uh, a bank and I want to buy a, a quantum secured communication system, do I need to employ a quantum guy to tell me exactly how it works and things like that? Or can I just rely on some sort of certificate that this system does what it says on the box? And it's this kind of thing which enshrined in law would really act as a, as, a, as a market pull. It would help encourage companies to take up this technology. Once you have that pull, then other companies that manufacture this technology will start setting up shop here because the market is here. And that kind of sets the ball rolling. And the idea, at least my idea, is to get that snowballing into larger, uh, larger, wider quantum field, wider quantum sphere. So that's just an example. Um, uh, it has been suggested that it would be also useful to create a science park where talent uh, and, and, and startups uh, and academics and entrepreneurs and residents and uh, um, uh, investors, of course, uh, can uh, be together and by osmosis yeah. <laughs> uh, at the coffee machine, um, mutually uh, energize and, 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 and cross fertilize their ideas. And, and you know, a lot of uh, these things uh, coexist, for example, uh, storing those certificates on blockchain and whatever else is a perfectly natural Bingo. thing. So, um, in in your experience in interacting with uh, the Maltese uh, infrastructure, uh, what are the um, uh, lowest hanging fruit uh, to overcome the, the the barriers that prevented this uh, from happening uh, uh, up to now? Um, that's a very very good question. Uh... I think one of the barriers is physical, in the sense that things in this country happen very organically in many ways. Uh, so you'd have a sort of a center of a, a tiny center of excellence popping up here, a tiny center of excellence popping up the other way. Even with when these were at university, they're kind of physically separate from one another. And yes, people don't meet that often. Uh, there is not such a strong history of uh, collaboration between very different fields. Um, maybe one could argue there's a, a global phenomenon and, you know, we're becoming more and more uh, interdisciplinary in the way work we do. But, you know, let's, let's take this as a particular case. And, and yes, having a sort of a, a place where people meet over coffee constantly. I mean, I've seen that work elsewhere and it would be lovely to have, have that here. So I, I would say one of the f first barriers is physical. Um, the other is that, yes, when things evolve organically, um, you evolve a nucleus of good people around something you already have, but sometimes it's good to sort of cast your fishing line and, and dig up, you know, bring up new technologies, new ideas, completely new, new niches that you might not necessarily have the expertise for right now, but could be very good in the future. And this is something which we're seeing more and more of with this, with this MDIA, for example. Uh, so I would say those are the two big reasons. So uh, with regards to the uh, experiment with Sicily mm -hmm. and, uh, and the grant you received uh, uh, and in your studies in, in general, what are the, the next challenges? What is the next milestone that uh, you want to achieve? Um, okay, so the experiment with Sicily was a, a kind of, uh, it was a, an infield test. So we had no lab, we had no, actually we had a van in Sicily. And it, was, it was really infield in every sense. Uh, that was good. Now I want to try and take that from the proof of concept run over three weeks to something which is more permanent. And I want to do that as a next, as a, as a step towards connecting with uh, Italy, mainland Europe in what what's being called the quantum internet where eventually someone at the Prime Minister's office over here can pick up the phone and have a quantum encrypted conversation with someone in Brussels. 
so 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 what, that is one of the things we're moving towards. So basically, making sure that this country innovates at the right pace to be able to hook on to these uh, technological advancements which are being made in the rest uh, rest of the world and Europe specifically, and that we're not cut off from the rest of it. So this was one thing which I see in a very short term. So next three to five years, perhaps. Wonderful. Good luck with that. Congratulations for all the work you've done uh, until now. And uh, thank you very much for this. You're very welcome. Thank you.